Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, Gaming with the Colonel. I'm Sean Moran. Uh, welcome to the channel. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, Panzerkrieg uh, by Avalon Hill. Um, a little bit about this game. Uh, it was first published in 1978 uh, and the pub designer's name was uh, John uh, Prados. And this game was actually published by a uh, company called Kasi, I think they're still around, uh, OSG obviously, and some other company called Six Angles that I know nothing about. <clears throat> this particular one is the Avalon Hill version. I picked this up when I was, I want to say 16 or 17, it's going a little way back now. I think I got in Victoria, um, and uh, at that time I was playing things like Panzer Leader and whatnot, uh, maybe some Squad Leader. I, I think I played Third Reich once with a, with a buddy, and I was looking for something else, and uh, I picked this one up. You'll see it's a little bit, seen a little bit of love. <laughs> I've uh, had it for a while, carried it around to a couple of different places. Um, it's an operational based game, so we're talking about uh, divisions, and uh, in, in this case the Russians I think are using cores, uh, and it's about the war in southern Russia um, with von Manstein and uh, Harris Group Sooth South. So let's, um, I think what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the game sequence, that sort of thing. I actually already played it. I actually, uh, it's been on my table now for for gosh weeks. I finished it, and I'll, we'll talk about that. And I have one last turn to do, so I guess I didn't really finish it. I have one last turn to do with the Russians, so uh, we can talk about that when we get to that. Okay, so uh, a couple things. Um, you, in this, with the Avalon Hill version, you, you actually get uh, some things like uh, charts and tables. This is actually a terrain effects chart. Um, as well as the bottom there gives you a weather effects table. Uh, on the back of this one, you get a combat results table with detailed description of what those combat results are and a weather uh, intensity table. Um, I, over the course of time, have printed off a couple of things from Board Game Geek. Um, there is a Hang on a second here. There is a, a very simple sort of pl Panzer Creed player's aid. You you get in the in the in the game actually a rules folder and um, a scenario and study folder with a bit of history, kind of some neat stuff. And some other things too is you the somebody put together all the errata from uh, Avalon Hill. Um, this is actually quite extensive. Uh, how many pages is this? It's got to be. Yeah, it's got to be about six pages of errata. Uh, and I've got something else here. Something from John Ellsworth, again, about something about the rules to this game. Anyways, I, I won't go into that. Um, there's a fair number of counters. I, in my wisdom, way back when, uh, put them into these sort of plastic containers. It's, Which is probably now, in retrospect, not the greatest. I should have come up with something better, but... That's how I divided it, because you do have a lot of different counters in terms of your your uh, you know, armored and infantry. Obviously, you got headquarters, you've got leaders, you've got um, you've got some support units, some anti-tank, uh, even some artillery, and you've got air and close air support and things like that. So, a little bit about the game in terms of sequence and, and how it goes. So, it starts off with a um, Oh, first off, there there are in the scenarios. There's actually a number of scenarios, and it starts sort of at the beginning uh, with uh, the Kiev pocket, sort of your early war period, uh, 27 August 1941. Um, there's the winter counteroffensive, January 42, and there is the drive on Stalingrad, Stalingrad, uh, 29th of June 1942. That's a pretty uh, pretty big scenario. You've got Stalingrad itself, which is in 1942, and you actually, you're setting up quite far as the Germans on, on this side of the map. And, uh, backhand below, February 43, aftermath of Citadel, 43, battle for Dnieper, 43, pocket at Corson, 44. There actually is a Manstein counter 
stroke. It's a what if kind of scenario. I played it once, um, and it actually comes with a, ma a major scenario card that you can actually uh, you know, put all your counters on. You'll see at the top part of my screen, uh, I printed off uh, that little sheet from uh, the scenario um, card, and all it is is it's just to help me set up. It's got where where things go when they come in, that sort of thing. It, it seemed kind of useful for for this time around. Okay, so all the scenarios really have a set of objectives, and in this particular, the Kiev scenario, um, the Germans were quite, let's say, far back along this line, and what you'll see on the map here, some people like it, some people don't, is there's some subdued, um, uh, these are like yellow lines, that tell you where to set up. You probably see the brown lines, those are roads, there's blue lines, those are those are railroads, and the... the uh, Yellowy hexes are, are crossing sites uh, uh, where you can cross uh, 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 rivers. There's major rivers and minor rivers. There's obviously swamp. Uh, there's a little bit of mountain and a little bit of uh, uh, sort of forest terrain. That's about it. Anyway, so the the Germans had to take a, a number of of, of cities, um, and, you know, Odessa, things like that, including right up to uh, Rostov. And you had to do it by the end of game turn seven in this particular scenario. Uh, the Russians win by you know, stopping the um, the Germans from from doing so. So actual sequence of play for this game: it starts off with a with a um, weather determination. So you roll for weather, and in the summer months, you know it's not a huge effect to, on weather. What it will do, though, is um, if you get like rain, it provides a minus one to your your die roll. Where that becomes a factor is that you, when you have leaders involved into combat, they give you a plus two on your die roll. That's the modifier you're trying to roll roll high, and uh, so that can bring it down a little bit. Um, so you've got a weather determination phase, and then you do a supply phase, which basically you're just checking to make sure you've you've you're in supply. I, I won't go into the details of that because it's it's sort of typical. You can trace the line back to near western edge, that sort of thing. You do have to have, be within a few, uh, a number of hexes uh, to, a, to a railroad or something like that, or a road. Uh, then you've got your actual movement phase. So, and again, it's kind of a typical Avalon Hill thing. You, you've got a movement factor. Um, if you don't know the counters very well, let me just pick up this Lieb Standard Adolf Hitler division. Uh, obviously SS in black. So first, first, um, Number eight is their combat factor, and uh, eleven is their is their movement factor. I'll just flip it over because uh, the Russians don't have a lot of these two-step counters, but the Germans majority of them are. So in this case, when he takes losses, he flips over to a three dash eleven. Okay, so you've got your movement. You uh, and the way this works in terms of Zox, um, it's the the uh, armored or mech units have Zox, whereas the infantry. Infantry, infantry have Zoc, but only for their own inherent hex is really what it is. It's one way to say that, I guess. Uh, which is interesting, you know, compared to some of the old classic Avalon Hills where you've, you know, everything's got a Zoc and you can't move around and that sort of thing. And you can move into a Zoc, obviously. And moving out of a Zoc, it's it's just a it's a movement penalty is what it is. Um, in fact, I think it's minus three or, or, you, or it costs you three movement points. So you've got movement phase. Then when you are adjacent to somebody, then you can you can actually choose to do combat. You don't have to do combat. Um, and within combat, you if you get a high enough uh, roll, um, you'll actually and you have an armored unit involved in the attack. And if you um, have an armored unit that's or a mech unit that's not participating in the attack. You can get something called uh, a breakthrough. Okay, so you see here it's got breakthrough. This is like uh, typical for seven to one odds. Defender back two, defender back two, exchange, defender eliminated, and then breakthrough. So what breakthrough allows you to do is is to do exploitation. So the units that were adjacent that did not um, attack uh, can then do exploitation and move their normal movement and then attack again. And that's uh, obviously very useful for the Germans trying to uh, make uh, big leaps and gains and that sort of thing. 
And if you haven't, you, you can pre-stage your air for a, a certain attack on a hex that you think you're going to break through and then use that air on, on that uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, there is that. So then after the, the combat phase, there's just basically an administration phase. Uh, oh, uh, and of course, in the beginning, you would have gotten all your any reinforcements or anybody coming in to, uh, off the map. So, um, about combat, uh, they're, um, <clears throat> obviously it's odd based and it's, uh, it's your combat factors, uh, added up and then compared to, uh, your opponent, um, you, you have air power, um, that you can, you can add to, uh, the combat, uh, and you have actually air bases and, you know, they, they, they stay in towns on, and you want them on a railroad so they can actually be moved around. Um, <clears throat> there's obviously terrain if you're attacking across a river or if you were in woods or if you were in a, um, a city or a town, you get a bonus. Uh, um, the defender, you know, your, your, your combat factors may be uh, a third of what they are in, in some cases. Uh, so you need to keep that in mind when you're doing your attacks. And also really interesting in this game is that you have headquarters units, and particularly for the Russians. Um, so headquarters units, you need them uh, within a certain number of hexes. Uh, I want to say it's six, but let's, but I can't remember because it's the top of my head. The, with, um, within, let's say, six hexes of your units in order for them to attack. Or whatever hex they're going to attack, it has to be from you know, six hexes away. So, so to allow the attack. So there's that. But also, they, they dispatch reserves, meaning so if the Germans are attacking uh, the Russians and there's a headquarters unit uh, behind them with a, let's say an infantry unit, you know, stacked with them, that headquarters can dispatch that uh, reserve uh, at the, you know, just right before the battle is going to begin and uh, change the odds of the actual attack. So one way to counter that um, is to set up an air attack because you can do an air attack only on that headquarters and you can actually just attack the headquarters unit. You, know, you don't have to attack everybody in the stack and if you disrupt that headquarters unit which is depicted I think as a asterisk on uh, the combat results table then that headquarters can no longer uh, um, dispatch those reserves so uh, that's just something to keep in mind if you're trying to uh, get a you know higher odds on and make a breakthrough because that's really what the Germans are trying to do is open things up and and uh, and make some big breakthroughs and um, exploit and, and get in there and get those cities and hopefully survive any uh, sort of counterattack. So uh, this particular scenario in Kiev, um, it was kind of interesting. Uh, I <laughs> it came down to basically what I said at the beginning. This is the last turn, right? So I was, I think. A turn, two turns ago, I was I was over here for the majority of my my forces, and this is these are actually uh, Romanians down here, and there's some Italians as well in this particular scenario. That's kind of neat too, is that it's they they've done all that, they've they've made those counters for you've got Romanians and I want to say you've got Hungarians and I don't remember if you got Bulgarians, but you, maybe you do. But um, so I was way back here. I got I got lucky on a couple of exploitation rolls because you only actually have seven turns to get all of these objectives, and you start way over here. Uh, and I actually took the final objective, which was which was raw stuff, and it came down to me using exploitation. You'll see these markers here. Um, I don't remember why I've got them down here. It must have been some sort of it's supposed to symbolize some sort of exploitation movement that you've done. That's the other thing. There are other marker counters here, like the uh, you can. Uh, the Russians can use fortifications, and there's other other markers if you get like a stalemate in a combat result, uh, whereas nothing happens and the the defender that turn has to, has to attack the next turn. Um, so things like that. Anyways, so it came down to the last turn, and here I am, and now it would be the Russians' final turn to actually try to counterattack. So I've lost raw stuff. Let's see what's up here. Another objective that. Sorry, guys. It's been a little. It's it's been on the table for a while, so I can't remember. Uh, 
I'm not going to try to pronounce that, but there's a city up here that I think I, I was part of the objectives, but <laughs> no way in heck I'm going to be able to take it. So let's even see if this is feasible. So what I would try to do, these are all armored units down here, so they have Zox. You know, when I look at this, there's no way in hell the Russians would be able to take this. I guess what I would have done is moved as many forces as I could down here. My air can't even make it. Yeah, it doesn't even... These guys are... Oh, they're, they're now in supply, because they could trace a line this way, I guess. To this railroad. Oof. Yeah, this is ugly. I, you know, it's not even worth it. I, I would have tried to move back here, get as best odds as I can, throw as much as I can, and and take out, uh, try to take back raw stuff, but I, it's a, it's a pipe dream. Uh, okay, so, really, uh, let's just do some uh, final thoughts about it. So this is a, a medium complexity game. Um, you know, there's a fair number of rules, but nothing earth-shattering. Um, it, uh, I mean, I always, whenever I play it, and I probably, I play it once a year, I, I have to go through and do a quick read, but I've, I've done it so often now that it's 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 fine. But I remember when I was younger and struggling with with rules, and, and remember it's just about how things laid out, how you like to see things, right? How I read something, you you'll read differently and go, you know, no, that's easy, you know, you know, whatever, right? Or or vice versa. Um, it's a fun game. I like it. I think because of the operational aspect, and you can you get the breakthroughs, and you. You know, in the or obviously in the early wars, the Russians were struggling, and then well, in the end, the the Germans are. Um, the the Avalon Hill version. Let's talk about that. The hexes are tiny, and <laughs> I guess that was something that they did way back when to save some money or whatever. I'm, I'm not sure. I understand that the OSG board is way better. It might be a paper board. I I don't know exactly, but the the hexes are are obviously much bigger. Uh, I saw some comment about whether there's going to be a reprint of this game on Board Game Geek recently, that, or maybe that was a year ago or something like that, but who knows. Um, the, the counters are, you know, typical sort of fashioned uh, Avalon Hill kind of counters. Um, uh, the board is the biggest you know, problem in terms of the, the hexes, because you'll have massive stacks and then you'll, you'll obviously knock something over, and I should probably get tweezers whenever I'm playing it, but but that doesn't stop me from playing it because I, because I do I do really enjoy it. Um, in fact, I think one time last year I played through about three or four different scenarios, which was kind of fun because you're kind of doing like a whole southern campaign at, at one go, right? But it does take a it does take a, a fair bit of time um, uh, to play this game. It's not a it's not one of those two hour kind of games. Um, yeah, what else to say? I I I, I come to this, you know. When I go through a bunch of my block games and I want to get back into some sort of traditional, more hex encounter, um, and it, that just focuses sort of on one, not not theater, but one area of, of the Russian campaign. I think I would like to try maybe, um, what's the GMT one, Rostov 41, or the Stalingrad one. Um, I, I, I think those would be similar to this, or, or at least I'd get the same feeling, but I don't know enough about them. So I would uh, I'd recommend the game, but I'd probably recommend you would uh, look for the OSG version, and maybe not the Avalon uh, Avalon Hill one. But it'll it'll be in my collection forever, just because it's nostalgic and uh, and uh, yeah, I just I just like playing it. It's it's mine. Okay, um, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, let me know if you got any comments. Uh, maybe you got some other games like this that maybe I would enjoy. I'd appreciate that. Otherwise, uh, take care.